Good day, learners and listeners. This is our first program in our series of agricultural science, which is produced for grade 10 and 11 learners and anybody else who is interested. Today we are discussing the water cycle, groundwater resources, and water conservation. Please get your pen and a notebook ready, as I'll ask you a few questions at the end of this program. My name is Anna Iambo, and today we have Asteria and Malakia with us in the studio. Say hello to the listeners. Hello, Hi. listeners. At the end of this program, you should be able to describe the water cycle, describe the significance of groundwater resources, and describe the importance of water conservation. Hi, Malakia. Hi, I, Asteria. I haven't seen you since 2019 when we were still together in the same school in grade 9. How have you been? How is the new school? I've been fine. And school is school, Asteria. Nothing to get excited about. I don't understand you. Last year you hated school and you could not even wait for the bell to ring. And now, all of a sudden, you like school? Uh, we really have good teachers this year, I must say. And let me tell you, our new agriculture teacher, Mrs. Nambahu, is a really good teacher. Her classroom is so bright and colorful and interesting. There are posters and pictures everywhere. You can never be bored in that class. Posters and pictures? About what? You know, it's the agriculture class. So when you walk in there, there are posters about animals, gardens, agricultural products, and posters about the nitrogen circle and the water cycle. Wait, wait, wait a bit. You have always struggled with the water cycle? And now you tell me you have a poster in your class about it? Why doesn't my teacher have one? Does this poster help you understand the water cycle? Of course it does. And I also had not realized how easy it was to understand until I saw that poster. Oh, now do you think you can remember the poster well enough to help me understand? <laughs> Why not? This is my chance to play teacher to you who have always copied my homework in grade 9. Just take out a notebook because I'm going to ask you to write down a few words to help you remember this. Listeners, you can start by writing the word rain in the middle at the top of the page. We'll first look at what happens to water that falls when it rains. What do you mean? What happens to the water? If it falls, what else? But have you ever thought of what exactly happens to that water that falls on the ground? Oh my word, are you making me use my brain? Mm -mm. I've seen how water runs on the soil starting from the little streams that run off the bigger streams. Near our farm, I've seen how these streams run into the river when it rains. Good! You have used the word I was looking for, runoff. Can you write it down right in the middle of the page? Okay. You have also used the word river. Write that in the line under runoff, please. Okay. So, so rain falls and the water runs off. Hmm. That is not a cycle. A cycle goes back to the beginning. Don't be in such a hurry. Where else can the water run off to? Think. You have seen it before, but maybe not thought of it in the sense of it being part of the water cycle. Near our village in the north, I've seen water run off to collect in the Oshanas. Can that be the part of the water cycle? Yes, it is. You will just now see why. Where else does the water run off to? Well, I suppose everywhere it can collect and form part of a large body of water such as earth dams, rivers, lakes, and even maybe the sea. Now you are getting it. So write all those water bodies in the same line as river. Mm -hmm. Now you can draw arrows from the word run off to river, lake, oceana, dam, and ocean. But is that the only thing that happens to the water when it rains, though? Does some of the water not go into the ground as well? 
Yes, Malakia. A lot of water infiltrates into the soil and it is used by plants or forms part of the underground water. It is the water that cannot infiltrate that runs off. You can also write infiltrate and underground water under runoff. Can you see that your arrows are still all pointing down? And like you said, is it not a cycle yet? Asteria, where does the water that falls as rain come from? Are you not supposed to talk about a cycle? Everything is still in a straight line. Yes, miss. Let's get that water back to the atmosphere. How can this happen? Evaporation. From where does the water evaporate? From the soil, the dams, lakes, or shanas, uh, also rivers, and also streams, and most of all the ocean. Wait, I'm starting to see everything here. My arrows now go upwards from these words towards the atmosphere. You see, now you are even explaining it to us. Is that the only way water goes back into the atmosphere? What about plants? Can they not help? Yes, but plants also transpire. How does that help? What is transpiration? Well, transpiration is evaporation from the leaves of the plants. Oh my, I just said evaporation again. So I can write transpiration also with an arrow going upwards. You surely can. Do you think human beings and animals can also help with the water cycle? Okay, well, when we breathe or sweat, water vapor is released from our bodies, right? The same for animals. Do you want to tell me that little bit of water vapor also plays a part in the water cycle? Ay, Malakia. Ay, Malakia. Are you the only one on earth that breathes? Not at all. There are 7.8 billion people on earth that breathe out a little water vapor. Plus, many animals and millions of plants that release water vapor. This process of living organisms releasing water vapor into the atmosphere is called respiration. This is your third word with an arrow going up. Okay, Esteria. But now we have all the water vapor in the atmosphere. What now? Good question. As the water vapors moves up, it becomes colder and condensation takes place because, as you know, when water vapor touches colder surfaces, condensation takes place. And this is when raindrops form, right? 100% correct. Wait, wait, wait. We have a water cycle. Now the rain falls again and the whole process keeps on going and going. Wow, Miss Esteria. You are a great teacher. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with Malakia? Why do you look so worried? I think I have a problem now. It is easy to use the water that collects on the earth's surface. But what about the water that is infiltrated in the soil? I have two problems with that water. I want to keep it in the soil for plants. But I also want it out of the soil for my animals to drink. That is a sort of dilemma for me. Oh, it's easy to get the water out of the soil. We do it all the time at Ongenga in the Hangwena region. We dig a wall with spades and take the water out with a rope and a bucket. Yes, but you can only do that if the water is not too deep under the ground. What would you do if the water is deep underground where your spade would not reach? Mm, I know. My father had done this before on our farm near Tumep. People come with a big drill and they drill a deep hole into the ground to reach the water. That's very well. But how on earth do you get the water out? How long will your rope have to be to get the bucket down there? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 miss. That would be ridiculous. My father had put up a pump to pump out the water. So farmers can still make use of underground water by digging wells and drilling take two and drilling boreholes. That is right. We must just be careful not to drill too many boreholes as these will deplete the underground water. Malakia? Yes. 
What about your other problem of trying to keep up as much water in the soil as possible for plants to use? I think I can come up with one way to keep the water in the soil longer mulching. A layer of material on the soil surface will reduce evaporation and keep the water in the soil for longer. Excellent. But by now, plowing or digging the soil unnecessarily. The farmer can also make sure that the wet subsoil is not brought to the top where it dries out. Therefore, keeping the water in the soil for longer. This is known as minimum tillage. Asteria. Yes. When we start with this work at our school, I will be the star of the show. That was great. Can we meet again and we do the nitrogen cycle? Absolutely. That is a nightmare that can keep one awake for a whole week. <laughs> You're always welcome and I'm glad I could help. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Asteria. Goodbye. Bye. Let us now look at what we've learned from today's lesson. Evaporation, transpiration and respiration take place from the soil and water surfaces. Condensation takes place and the water falls back to the earth. Groundwater can be harvested by digging wells and drilling boreholes. Water can be conserved in the soil by mulching and minimum tillage. You can now answer the following questions in your notebook. 1. State three ways how water vapor moves to the atmosphere. 2. Explain what a farmer can do to keep water in the soil for longer. And 3. Differentiate between a well and a borehole. Listeners and learners, this brings us to the end of today's lesson about water cycle and water conservation. This lesson was written by Susan Lawrence. I hope you've enjoyed the lesson and have taken notes to study. So until next time, take care. This program was brought to you by Namcol with funding from the Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture and the Commonwealth of Learning. Good day, learners and listeners. This is our second program in our series on agricultural science, which is produced for grade 10 and 11 learners and anybody else who is interested. Today we're discussing the nitrogen cycle. Please get your pen and a notebook ready to take notes as I will be asking you questions at the end of the program. My name is Ana Iambo, and today we have Nangula and Brendan with us in the studio. Say hello to the listeners. Hello. Hello. At the end of this program, you should be able to describe the nitrogen cycle in terms of decomposition by microorganisms, nitrogen fixation on the roots, absorption of nitrogen compounds and their conversion to proteins, and the role of microorganisms in decay and the return of nitrogen to the soil or the atmosphere. Names of individual bacteria are not required. Nangula and Brandon, you two have explained to me that there is a lot of nitrogen in the atmosphere and that nitrogen takes up 78% of gases found in the atmosphere. That's right, miss. But do you know what makes nitrogen so important? No, I don't. And I was wondering why you want to come and tell the listeners about the nitrogen cycle. Why is nitrogen important? 
Nitrogen is an important building block of protein which is needed for the growth of all living organisms. You remember how your mother told you to eat vegetables? To get enough minerals and vitamins to keep you healthy? And help you grow normally? Well, you also need a lot of protein in your diet because it is very important for growth. So if there's no nitrogen, protein cannot be made in the body of the plant or animal or human? That's right. And that is why it is so important to understand how it is recycled in the environment. The problem, however, is that the nitrogen in the atmosphere cannot be used by plant as such. It has to be changed and that happens in the nitrogen cycle. Mm -mm. That really sounds complicated. No, it just sounds complicated, but it really isn't. Our teacher always tells us not to study the pictures of the nitrogen cycles we see in textbooks because if the picture changes, you are lost. You have to understand the processes. Okay then, talk to me. There are four main processes involved in the nitrogen cycle, namely nitrogen fixation, ammonification, nitrification and denitrification. The listeners can take any diagram of the nitrogen cycle and follow these processes in the cycle to help them understand it better. Let's start with nitrogen fixation by legumes. This is the process through which bacteria that live in the root nodules of legume plants convert nitrogen from the air into nitrates in the soil. When the legume plant dies and decomposes, nitrates are released into the soil. Other plants that grow in the same soil will be able to benefit from it. That is why it's so important to include a legume plant in any crop rotation program. So legume plants are the only plants that have these nodules on their roots? That's right. And remember, it is not the plant as such that supplies the nitrogen, but rather the nitrogen fixing bacteria in the root nodules of the legume. So where I see a plant in the nitrogen cycle, that's where nitrogen fixation takes place? That's correct. Do you see how easy it is? You don't have to study a picture. Yeah, it's now getting interesting. Tell me more. The plants can now absorb the nitrogen compounds, which is the nitrate. Animals eat the plants and they obtain these nitrates in the plants. Nitrogen has now become part of the body of the animals. As plants and animals die, they are decomposed by microorganisms in the soil. This process of decomposition releases the nitrogen compounds, which is now ammonia, back into the soil. This process is called ammonification. You're making it very clear now. Nitrogen fixing bacteria in the root nodules of legumes change nitrogen to nitrates in the soil that plants can take up. This is nitrogen fixation. Animals eat the plants and the nitrogen compounds are now part of the body of the animal. As plants and animals die and decompose, ammonia is released. This is ammonification. You see, you are now not studying a specific diagram. You just have to understand the processes. And remember that we said that plants take up nutrients. As you can see from the process of ammonification, ammonia is formed. The plant cannot take it up. It has to change further. There are other bacteria in the soil that convert the ammonia into nitrates and then still further into nitrates. You see, there we have our nitrates. This process where ammonia is changed to nitrates and then to nitrates by nitrifying bacteria is called nitrification. So there are different bacteria in the nitrogen cycle that are important for different processes? You are absolutely right. There are nitrogen fixing bacteria in the root nodules of a legume and nitrifying bacteria in the soil that change ammonium compound to nitrate and nitrate for plants to take up. Yes. I now understand these processes, but I do have a problem. What is your problem? I don't see a cycle. I see nitrogen in the atmosphere, 
in the soil, in plants, in animals and back in the soil, but that's not a cycle. Let me close the cycle for you by letting the nitrogen back into the atmosphere. How on earth is that possible? <laughs> well, I'm getting there. There is another group of bacteria in the soil that live in conditions where they need oxygen. They convert the nitrates back into nitrogen and oxygen. These bacteria use oxygen and the nitrogen then escapes back into the atmosphere. These are called aerobic bacteria. The process is called denitrification. And there I have my cycle. Now I understand what you mean by not studying a diagram, but rather understanding the process. We did not even have a diagram with us and I understand the four processes. Nitrogen fixation, ammonification, nitrification and denitrification. And in all four of these processes, different bacteria play an important role. Wow, why was it not so easy when I was at school? Thank you very much, you too. You're welcome. You're welcome. Let us now look at what we've learned from today's lesson. Bacteria that live in roots of legume plants absorb nitrogen from the atmosphere and convert it to nitrate through nitrogen fixation. Nitrogen is released into the soil when the legume plants die and decompose. Decomposers change the nitrogen found in dead plants and animals into ammonia and return it to the soil. This is called ammonification. Ammonium compounds are converted into nitrites and further into nitrates by nitrifying bacteria through nitrification. Aerobic bacteria break nitrate into nitrogen and oxygen. Nitrogen escapes back into the atmosphere through the process of denitrification. You can now answer the following questions in your notebook. 1. Name the four processes involved in the nitrogen cycle. 2. State which plant plays an important role in the nitrogen cycle. 3. Explain how ammonium compounds are changed into nitrates. And 4. Describe the process of denitrification. Listeners and learners, this brings us to the end of today's lesson about the nitrogen cycle. This lesson was written by Susan Lawrence. I hope you enjoyed the lesson and have taken notes to study. So until next time, take care. The Educational Radio Initiative is possible with support from the Ministry of Education as part of the Education and Training Sector Improvement Program. program, 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 program. Good day learners and listeners. This is our third program in our series on agricultural science which is produced for grade 10 and 11 learners and anybody else who is interested. Today we are discussing community-based natural resource management and more specifically conservancies. Please get your pen and a notebook ready 
as I'll ask you questions at the end of this lesson. My name is Anna Iambo, and today we have Saima and Shimbinae with us in studio. Say hello, guys. Hello. hello. At the end of this program, you should be able to define what is meant by conservancies, Discuss the history of community-based natural resource management in Namibia. Discuss the importance of conservancies to commercial farmers and areas of communal land in Namibia. Discuss the role of farmers in conservation of wildlife resources and identify three conservancies in different regions from the updated list of registered conservancies in Namibia. Saima and Shimbinae? Yes, yes ma'am. Ma before we go any further, please explain to me what community-based natural resource management means. Do you really learn about such complicated things in school? <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly what we asked our teacher. This is seriously a mouthful. We wanted to run out of the class. But fortunately, our teacher understood our frustration and explained it to us as follows. First, I want you to write down the words on a piece of paper. Community-based natural resource management. I've written it down, but it still doesn't make sense to me. Fortunately, our teacher explained it to us very clearly. Let us read it backwards. Let me help you. The management of the natural resources is based in the community. Is that better? The management of the natural resources is based in the community. Oh my word. That means that the community manages their own natural resources. That's so easy. Please go thank your teacher for me. Now tell me more. It all starts with conservancies. I'm sure you and the learners and the listeners have all seen signs along the road that say, A Pupa Conservancy or Coco Conservancy, or Vitoto Conservancy, there are a lot more. I've seen the sign for Kongoro Conservancy. What's a conservancy? Well, a conservancy consists of a group of commercial farmers of areas of a communal land on which members pool resources for the purpose of conserving and using wildlife sustainability. Yo, ha -ha. You are again talking over my head. <laughs> it just means that in this area, where a group of farmers are working together to conserve the environment and the wildlife, it can be on either communal farms or commercial areas. These farmers use and manage the environment in such a way so that long-term sustainability is ensured so that the future generations can also benefit from the resources. And it's so important to look after our resources. If people are working together to do so, it will be even more successful. But where did that all start? The introduction of firearms and a succession of wars in Namibia led to a tremendous decrease in wildlife through the country. Since the establishment of the first conservancies in Namibia in 1996, a lot of changes have taken place in specifically communal areas. The wildlife population has increased. Rural communities have taken control over managing their resources and employment and income generation have increased. Local people have been empowered to take control over decision making in their environment and they started to benefit from the resources. That's right. Well, in 1992, the Ministry of Wildlife Conservation and Tourism developed a policy that provides rights over wildlife and tourism to be given to the communities that form a conservancy. These rights were to be exercised throughout the communal conservancies. The first four communal conservancies were formed in 1998 and to date there are more than 80 conservancies in Namibia. I never realized there are so many and that they are backed by the law. But are conservancies only important in communal areas? Absolutely not. Both commercial farmers and areas of communal land in Namibia benefit from conservancies. Well, 
For commercial farmers, conservancies mean that the natural resources in the whole area is sustained. The wildlife on the farms at any given time belong to the farmer and if the game is sold, the farmer keeps the money. The farmer can also stock different game species on the farm to improve tourism. Wait, Shimbinai. You said the game on the farm at any given time belongs to the farmer. What do you mean by that? Well, let me explain. Say Saima and I are neighbors, right? And we share a fence on the border of our farms. I take some of my friends in my 4x4 to have a look at the wildlife on my farm. Near the fence, between my farm and Saima's farm, we see a lot of kudus. And now I'm showing off so badly. Look at all my kudus. My friends are impressed. The next moment, my dog starts barking and the kudus jump over the fence. <sighs> they are now Saima's kudus. No, wait, 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 wait. What happened now? He's correct, miss. The kudus now belong to me. Yes. I might feel defeated, but that is the beauty of a conservancy. Since we both belong to the conservancy, I know that kudus will be protected from poachers because we are both conserving wildlife in our conservancy. That's excellent. Tell me more. How does it work in communal areas? I'll tell you. In communal areas, it also ensures sustainability of natural resources as more farmers are taking care of their resources. Communal farmers enjoy the utilization of natural resources in the conservancy and have certain rights to wildlife in their environment. It also creates employment opportunities for more people in the conservancy when tourists start going to the areas. You see, because the community needs tourists to generate income, everyone is taking care of their natural resources and wildlife. That's a brilliant strategy. I'll for sure think of this next time I see a sign that says an area is a conservancy and I'm sure the listeners will too. It's easy to say a group of farmers can take care of the resources and wildlife, but tell me, what specifically can each farmer do on the farm or in the area to conserve wildlife? Well, one way is to make sure that there is always food and water available for the wildlife. That's a very good point. What else can they do? If wildlife is kept for tourism, the roads in the area should be kept in a good condition and safe camping sites should be made available. A tour guide is not going to bring tourists the second time if the road is full of potholes and dangas or if there is no safe place for the tourists to make a camp. Can you imagine a group of foreign tourists getting lost in an Namibian environment? It is therefore important that there should be very clear road signs to lead tourists to where they are supposed to be. This will also ensure that the environment is not damaged by the tourists driving around looking for a way out. Remember that it is important that the natural habitat of wildlife should be conserved at all times as far as possible. Now give me the names of all the conservancies. You're not serious, are you? By the end of 2012, there were already 77 registered communal conservancies alone registered in Namibia. To learn the name of all these would be impossible. You can find all these conservancies on one website www.nasco.org.na Then find the three different areas and learn the names. So the next time people are around you, you talk about the conservancies, you'll also know a few names. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a plan. Let me make sure that I have the website correct. www.nasco.org.na That is www.nasco.org.na I'll most certainly go and have a look and I hope the listeners will too. Listeners and learners, 
This was for sure a very interesting lesson. It did not even feel like schoolwork. Let us now see what we've learned from today's lesson. A conservancy is a group of farmers who work together to conserve wildlife and the environment. The importance of conservancies to commercial farmers are as follow. Farmers get incentives from the game on their farms. The income goes to individual farmers. They have the right to exclusive ownership over the wildlife on their farms. Sustainability of natural resources. Farmers stock different game species to improve tourism. And the importance of conservancies to communal farmers are Sustainability of natural resources Farmers have certain rights to wildlife Employment creation Farmers enjoy the utilization of natural resources and they obtain income from the wildlife. Also, farmers should supply food and water to wildlife keep roads in good condition put up clear road signs and provide safe camping sites. You can now answer the following questions in your notebook. 1. State what is meant by conservancy. 2. Discuss the importance of conservancies to communal farmers. And 3. Name any three conservancies in communal areas in Namibia and state in which areas they are located. Listeners and learners, this brings us to the end of today's lesson about community-based natural resource management conservancies. This lesson was written by Susan Lawrence. I hope you all enjoyed the lesson and have taken notes to study. Until next time, take care. The Educational Radio Initiative is possible with support from the Ministry of Education as part of the Education and Training Sector Improvement Program. program, 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 program. Good day learners and listeners. This is our fourth program in our series on agricultural science, which is produced for grade 10 and 11 learners and anybody else who is interested. Today we're discussing animal health and diseases. Please get your pen and a notebook ready to take notes because I will be asking a few questions at the end of this program. And today we have Modisha and Philemon with us in the studio. Say hello guys. Hello. hello. At the end of this program, you should be able to identify diseases, foot and mouth disease, red water, heart water, tuberculosis and anthrax, and parasites, roundworms and ticks affecting cattle in Namibia in general. Describe symptoms, causes and control of one of the common diseases and one of the parasites listed above. Distinguish ways in which diseases are spread, airborne, waterborne, infectious, contagious, and vectors. Discuss legislations about animal diseases with specific reference to notifiable diseases and animal movement. So Modisha and Philemon, you say you are here today to help current as well as future beef cattle farmers to control animal diseases and parasites. Is that correct? That is correct. We found it such an interesting topic that we can save a farmer so much money that we wanted to tell everybody about it. Good. Now which diseases are we talking about and how will I be able to identify these diseases? Well, there are quite a number of them. 
So listen carefully and make notes so that you can refer back to them when necessary. Let's start with food and mouth disease. Food and mouth disease is a highly contagious, notifiable disease caused by a virus. The symptoms are blisters on the feet and in the mouth, as well as continuous salivation. Wait, 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 wait. Stop right there. What are you talking about? What's a notifiable disease? <laughs> Someone doesn't know a lot about beef cattle farming in Namibia. A notifiable disease is a disease described by an act of government, Act 13 of 1956, that has to be reported to the nearest veterinary office immediately. The farm where the disease is suspected will be put under quarantine and all animals in that area must be vaccinated. These diseases are more contagious than other and can cause great economic losses. Yo, now I'm even more confused. It is only confusing because I have not explained it yet. It means that you can look in law books and you will find that notifiable diseases are described in there. There are diseases that should be reported to the authorities immediately so they can act. The farm where the disease is suspected will be put under quarantine. And I'm very sure that every Namibian child knows what this means, right? All animals on the neighboring farms and in the area will be then vaccinated to prevent the further spread of this disease. But why is this an issue? Why are all diseases not notifiable? Well, that's because notifiable diseases are more contagious than other diseases. And once cattle are infected, they cannot be sold. This then causes great economic losses. That's very, very, very understandable. I know Namibia gets a lot of income from beef cattle. I know Namibia gets a lot of income from beef cattle, so we do not want them to be sick. Tell me about some more diseases. Absolutely. The next one we want to talk about is red water. Red water is a tick bone disease. An animal with red water shows symptoms of increased temperature, diarrhea, red urine, an increased pulse rate, and abortion in pregnant cows. Okay. I think a farmer would be able to keep the animals free from ticks. What's next? The next disease I want to talk about is heart water. This is a disease that can affect cattle, sheep, and goats. It is caused by bacteria and is spread by infected ticks. The animal shows a lack of appetite, high body temperature, and will be walking around in circles. Fluid is found around the heart when the animal is cut open. There are the ticks again. What should a farmer do? Good question. Control ticks. But animals can be vaccinated against heart water. This disease does not occur in Namibia very often. Wow. Thank you for that. Are there more diseases you want to talk about? Yes. The next one is tuberculosis, or for short, TB. Cattle and pigs can be affected by tuberculosis that is spread by bacteria. This is an airborne disease which means it can be transmitted through the air. The pathogen spreads through breathing. The disease shows itself as coughing with a discharge from the eyes and nose of the animal. And animals can be vaccinated against tuberculosis. People also get TB. Can they get it from cattle? Absolutely. Eating unpasteurized milk products and drinking unpasteurized milk from infected heads is a prime source of infection. Oops. Better make sure you drink milk from tested cows or pasteurized milk then. There are two more that we quickly want to discuss and then we will discuss another one in detail. The first one is lung sickness. And in short is CBPP. This is another airborne bacterial disease in cattle. Cattle will be coughing and standing stiff-legged. Animals have to be vaccinated against lung sickness, which is a notifiable disease. 
The next one is brucellosis. This is also known as contagious abortion in cattle, sheep, goats, and pigs. Brucellosis is caused by bacteria and is spread through contact, which makes it a contagious disease. This means that the cow aborts their fetuses. Farmers can prevent brucellosis by vaccinating females from the age of six months. Which one did you want to discuss in detail? Yes, I wanted to discuss anthrax. This disease is a problem in the sense that we could give you the signs and symptoms of all the other diseases we discussed, but this one does not show any symptoms. Now, how on earth will I know my animals have anthrax? You won't. Anthrax is a notifiable disease. It is highly contagious and can be transmitted from a sick to a healthy animal through physical contact, air, or drinking contaminated water. It spreads quickly where animals are closer together in small areas. In most cases, there are no symptoms and the animal is found dead with blood coming from the nose and the anus. This disease spreads by bacteria that can also infect humans. Should an animal be found to have died of anthrax, the body should be burned and buried very deep underground. The meat should never be eaten. Anthrax vaccination is compulsory by law. When an animal is suspected to have anthrax at the abattoir, the animal is immediately removed. It is destroyed where the bacteria cannot spread to the other animals and humans. The whole area at the abattoir is cleaned and disinfected with chemicals. You also talked about parasites. What are those? There are a number of parasites, but we will just talk about roundworms and ticks. Roundworms are internal parasites that will cause animals to lose appetite and weight. Ticks are external parasites. And as you will recall from what we have discussed previously, they can be the carriers of many diseases. Ticks cause a lot of damage to the skin of the animals when they suck out the blood of the animal. This also causes blood loss and discomfort. Ticks can be removed by dipping and spraying. Ticks are called vectors. Vectors are organisms that transmit diseases from one animal to another without having the disease. At the abattoir, animals are sprayed before being slaughtered. The pens are cleaned and disinfected every day and deep cleaned once a week. Mm -hmm. I would like to know more about the laws that regulate beef cattle farming in Namibia. All right. Animals for export should be clearly marked because of meat exports to the European Union. Namibia has to comply with very strict veterinary requirements. Vaccination against all notifiable diseases is compulsory and proof of all vaccinations has to be produced upon inspection. In order to transport cattle, the farmer gets a movement permit from the veterinary office. The numbers on the ear tags of all the animals should be on the permit. To be a beef cattle farmer really sounds like a lot of work. Thank you very much, Modisha and Philemon, for a very interesting program. Let us now look at what we've learned in today's lesson. Diseases are caused by bacteria and viruses. Diseases can spread in the following ways. They are airborne. They can be waterborne. They are contagious. And they can be spread by vectors. Notifiable cattle diseases are controlled by law. You can now answer the following questions in your notebook. 1. Name the three ways diseases are spread in ruminants and give one example of each. 2. Explain what a notifiable disease is and give two examples of notifiable diseases that affect beef cattle. And 3. Discuss the role of laws in controlling the spread of diseases in Namibia. Listeners and learners, this brings us to the end of today's program about animal health and diseases. This lesson was written by Susan Lawrence. I hope you all enjoyed the lesson and have taken notes to study. 
So until next time, take care. The Educational Radio Initiative is possible with support from the Ministry of Education as part of the Education and Training Sector Improvement Program. 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 Good day, learners and listeners. This is our fifth program in our series on agricultural science, which is produced for grade 10 and 11 learners and anybody else who is interested. Today we are discussing how to control plant pests. Please get your pen and your notebook ready to make notes because I'll ask some questions at the end of the program. My name is Anna Iambo, and today we have Okeri and Elias with us in studio. Say hello to the listeners, guys. Hello, hello listeners. listeners. At the end of this program, you should be able to describe chemical, biological, and cultural methods in controlling one of each of the types of pests that will be discussed in today's lesson. Describe integrated pest management, that is IPM, as an ecosystem-based strategy which focuses on long-term prevention of pests or their damage through a combination of techniques and discuss the advantages and disadvantages of chemical, biological and cultural methods of pest control. Good morning, Okeri and Elias. Good morning. Good morning. So you say you want to talk about the control of plant pests. Do you know these pests? Yes, ma'am. We have done plant pests already and we know what types of pests usually attack our crops. What are these types of pests you're talking about? Well, they are biting and chewing pests, piercing and sucking pests, boring pests and swell pests. At least I know one example of them. Which one is that? Well, it's the one that everyone knows, a boring pest, which is a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all jokes aside now. How can we control pests in our gardens? Is it not just a matter of going to the store, buying a pesticide and spraying them? There are lots of pesticides for sale nowadays and they tell you exactly which pests you can get rid of. Yes, that is very easy and that was what we all did previously. But we need to be more aware of the environment, so we should try to use chemicals as little as possible. Then I'm lost. How else can I get rid of the pests? Well, there are actually a few other ways to get rid of pests. Let's talk about them to see if you can do it in another way. Alright, for starters, let's start with biological pest control. But Okeri, we are not busy with biology right now. This is agricultural science. Ma'am, bio means life. So, this means we are controlling pests with something that is alive. Such as? Some pests are very tasty to chickens. So you can put your chickens in your garden. Just make sure they do not eat your plants. What biological pest control means is that you can use a natural enemy to control pests. Another example is ladybirds that can be used to control aphids. There is also a parasitic wasp that can be used to control certain pests. This is the first time I hear about this. It's very interesting. What are the advantages and disadvantages of biological pest control? Well, one very huge advantage is that there is no damage to the environment. Just be careful that the organism that you use to control the pests do not start feeding on your crops. 
Yes, it's unfortunately true that for every advantage there is a disadvantage. What other method of pest control besides chemical and biological do you know of? Well, there is also cultural control. That might be a problem. Whose culture are you talking about? We might get problems if we start talking about culture during a lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Elias. Yes? I told you this is going to happen. No, ma'am. This is how kids in school also understand it. But it has nothing to do with what your culture is. I want to stress this. Cultural control is what the farmer does during his cultivation and it has nothing to do with his culture. Oh, now I get it. Cultural cultivation. That makes it easy to understand. Thanks for clearing that up for me, Okeri. Welcome. Okay. Cultural control means to manipulate the environment to control pests. There are a lot of things that a farmer or a gardener can do to prevent the reduce of pests in a garden. He or she can plant early so that the plants are strong when the pests come out. That enables them to better resist attacks by pests. Another method of cultural control is to use certified seeds. These seeds are cleaned and most of the time they have already been treated. They have already been treated to resist certain pests. If you have a lot of fruit in your garden, the fruit fly will definitely pay you a visit. They pierce the plant tissue and suck out the juice, leaving a rotten patch inside the fruit where the eggs are laid. You only see a small black spot on the beautiful fruit. You know, they only want the sweetness inside. So give them some of the sweetness. Just make a hole on the side of a big plastic bottle, put sugar water in, and hang it near the fruit. And there you have it. The pest will drink the sugar water and leave the fruit alone. Farmers can also plow during winter to destroy pests that stay in the soil for part of their life cycle. Talking about breaking the life cycle of the pest, you can also do this by practicing crop rotation. Certain pests only attack certain crops. If there's no crop to attack because it is planted somewhere else, the life cycle of the pest is broken and you can have fewer pests. Okay, Rick. Oh, yes, Elias. I see you cannot wait to tell us about your favorite method of cultural control. Go ahead, tell the listeners. Oh yes, I planned marigolds, marigolds, marigolds and marigolds. <laughs> what on earth are you talking about, Okeri? Marigolds are small orange and yellow flowers. I plant them once around my garden and when they die, I just dig them back into the soil and they grow again from the seeds on their own. They keep a lot of pests away. You'll have the most beautiful cabbage without a single effort on it. Oh Lord, I'm confused. How can a small flower keep pests away? <laughs> I'll tell you. They have a very strong smell that pests don't like. So, they rather stay away. There are also other strong smelling plants that you can plant and they even have uses in the kitchen too. You can also plant lavender, basil, lemongrass, rosemary and mint. To humans, these smell good, but insects hate the smell. Using cultural control methods takes time to get used to, and the effect is not immediate, but there is no damage to the environment. I hang my head in shame. I've been using chemicals such as BHC, Melathion lebicid, Aldin, Carbaryl and others all these years without thinking of the environment. And they are very, very expensive too, but they work so fast. Well, that is why we like to use them without thinking of the consequences. Yes, I do understand that it might not be easy to use other methods of control in big gardens for commercial use, but then one should make use of integrated pest management or for short, IPM. Is that now another new chemical? Yes, integrated pest management, IPM, is a pest control method that uses a combination of control measures to minimize the damage to the environment. 
These can include methods such as using biological control and cultural control measures together. IPM aims at getting rid of having to use chemicals to control pests. And yes, on large farms, it will start slowly and farmers will still include chemicals in the beginning. But the farmer should try to get rid of the chemicals gradually. Yes, you should always make sure that the methods of pest control is based on long-term prevention of pests and on a minimum damage to the environment. You've really opened my eyes to pest control today. And I can't wait to start planting those herbs you've mentioned around my garden. I'm sure the listeners are also ready to go. Thank you, Okeri and Elias. Let's now look at what we've learned from today's lesson. Chemical pest control is expensive and damages the environment, soil, and water. It does, however, work very fast. Biological pest control means bringing a natural enemy of pests to control them. The organisms brought in might start to feed on your plants though. Cultural pest control includes everything a farmer can do to control pests while cultivating the soil. This includes planting strong smelling plants, early plowing and early planting, crop rotation and the use of certified seeds. Integrated Pest Management IPM is a pest control method that uses a combination of control measures to minimize the damage to the environment. IPM aims to getting rid of having to use chemicals to control pests. Any method of pest control should be based on the long-term prevention of pests and on minimal damage to the environment. You can now answer the following questions in your notebook. 1. Describe cultural control as a method of plant pest control. 2. Discuss the advantages and disadvantages of using chemicals to control plant pests. And 3. Explain what is meant by integrated pest management. Listeners and learners, this brings us to the end of today's lesson about the control of plant pests. This lesson was written by Suzanne Lawrence. I hope you've enjoyed the lesson and have taken notes to study. So until next time, take care. The Educational Radio Initiative is possible with support from the Ministry of Education as part of the Education and Training Sector Improvement Program. 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 Program.